My, uh, my name's Al Sedelva. I work at Google um, with the Android Systems and Kernel team. Um, I'm here today to just talk about what we're doing in Android to uh, kind of improve support for the open source upstream stacks in AOSP, which is the Android Open Source Project. Um, I'm also going to kind of go through a little bit of what we're doing to align our partners and vendors uh, along the same path, um, and also just touch on some of our uh, testing and validation exercise. Um, so the talk is mostly from a kernel point of view because I work on the kernel team and um, obviously on Android there's a lot of implementation flexibility for user mode. Uh, so this will talk about kernel DR, like kind of DRM in the kernel and the user mode bits that you use with that. Um, so kind of anybody who works with Android is kind of familiar with this stack. This five, four or five years ago this was de facto. Um, Nobody used DRM. There was no libdrm. Um, it was just open source uh, stacks on Android weren't really a thing. Um, everybody had a FB dev driver that they'd modified to add a million ioctals. Uh, the Android requirements for Harbor Composer were implemented through extensions to the FB dev driver. Um, those FB dev drivers would oft often be just macro drivers that would contain support for the display, scalar hardware, rotation hardware kind of memory-to-memory -memory devices, um, even video codecs in some cases. Um, and then the 3D driver would also have some kind of uh, custom interface to user space. And so Android, kind of early on, abstracted away a lot of these uh, kernel interfaces with Gralic, Harbor Composer, the uh, codec stack, and the OpenGLES drivers being the kind of main interfaces uh, for Android that the framework would use which for a long time kind of worked. We shipped product. Um, people uh, were able to you know, use these devices with these driver stacks. But there is a lot of problem with this kind of stack because it's very difficult, difficult to test. You can only test it from a kind of integration, high-level integration point of view at the Android framework level. You can't test very well at kind of a unit test or uh, kind of any other kind of uh, compliance testing or performance testing or uh, anything like that. Um, so this is what we have. More and more devices now are shipping with this kind of stack. This is what I'm referring to as an upstream stack. Uh, drivers are using DRM. Uh, they're, they're using libdrm and, and, uh, and DRM Harbor Composer, which are open source projects. Um, often they'll use open source OpenGLES implementations like Mesa or um, Swift Shader. Um, not, still work to do on the kind of memory-to-memory -memory scalar devices. Um, je there was a generally not in fold, folded into DRM. Um, and then codecs as well. Video codecs is usually still a custom interface, but um, it's definitely better than it was. Um, so 3D drivers are usually implemented as a DRM render node, and um, we can use DRM, libdrm, which is kind of providing an, a layer just above the kernel that we can start plugging tests and, and other things into. And as you can see from the diagram, you, we're still using uh, the, the same HALs that Android exposes on, on the old stack, on the new stack. Um, it's just that those are designed to work with the, with the open source components. Um, so examples of how we are using uh, these upstream stacks in AOSP. So as of Pixel 3, it's using a DRM KMS driver. Um, and future Pixel devices hopefully will too. Um, we also have support for a variety of 96 boards and other boards that have been added for other reasons, like ARM32 compatibility. Um, these devices are all running. Um, they may not necessarily be running an open source uh, OpenGL driver, but they will be running kind of open source display drivers. Um, and for me, this is kind of a very valuable exercise, keeping these boards maintained in AOSP, because most of these boards can run upstream Linux, whereas most of the uh, SOC manufacturer devices can't. Um, so it kind of keeps us honest with respect to whether Android really supports the features of upstream and works correctly with that, and whether our requirements on the platform side are being met by features that are being developed upstream in Linux. Um, so uh, kind of one of the boards that we've added recently to AOSP is the uh, Dragonboard 845C device, which is um, the same SOC as Pixel 3, but it, but it will run upstream Linux uh, using the upstream display driver. Um, and it will, they also have it working with Freedrino on the, on the open source um, uh, GL driver uh, running on those devices. And in fact, that same stack can run on Pixel 3 now as well. There are some limitations on the display side, but 
it, it's getting there. Um, we, another thing to mention is we, we also have our virtual platform, which is used, I'll talk about it more in a second. Our virtual platform is used for CI uh, within Android, um, continuous integration testing. And uh, that platform is also kind of aligned to uh, this upstream stack now. So kind of our reference stack is the upstream stack. Um, so more on Cuttlefish, which is our virtual device. Um, so think of it as Android for Google Cloud. Um, it's KVM based, uh, which means uh, it, it requires hardware virtualization extensions. Um, it works on x86-64 and ARM64. Um, it's built on top of CrossVM, which is a, a virtual machine manager uh, maintained by a team on the Chrome OS side. Um, we use this platform for continuous integration, as I mentioned. So anytime you upload a change to AOSP review, the change will be tested on Cuttlefish. So if you upload a graphics or display related change or a kernel change, it will be validating it using the upstream DRM stack. Um, so it can boot upstream kernels, which means it doesn't just boot the kernels that Android ships in the release, which I'll go into in more detail. It, you can actually take a uh, tip of tree kernel from upstream um, with just a def, custom def config, which is in AOSP, you can build a kernel for that, for Cuttlefish, and run it on the device. Um, the GPU implementation for Cuttlefish is based on Swift Shader, which is a, a kind of open source uh, software uh, GPU implementation. Um, I guess kind of similar to LLVM pipe. Um, we can also use Mesa when you specify when launching the device with a specific flag, GPU mode equals DRM virtual, it will switch to using uh, virtual in Mesa uh, stack, and it will do that dynamically. Um, so that's in AOSP already. And that, la that enables a hardware acceleration of uh, guest graphics uh, in, the, in the instance. Um, and it's using uh, open source mini GBM and open source DRM hardware composer to solve Relic and the hardware composer. Um, things we don't have right now is we don't have Vulkan support, um, and that's because uh, Mesa's uh, upstream uh, virtual uh, backend doesn't support it yet. Um, we are working on an alternative solution for that. Um, and we're also interested in, in, in the spirit of testing, uh, adding support for more KMS planes and more pixel formats. And what this really means is when we run uh, Harbor Composer on our virtual platform at the moment, we are just running single plane. So all the composition that Android's doing is being done through OpenGL ES. Uh, but we would really like to make it so that the virtual platform looks more like a real platform, physical platform, and has the ability to uh, program frame pointers to the different KMS overlays. Um, and we also want to add support for different pixel formats just so we can test that as well, video stacks and cameras and all that other good stuff. Um, so. What about the, the, the kind of the real issue? Um, we've got this open source solution in AOSP we've using, we're using on our virtual platform. But what about vendors? What about devices that actually ship Android? Um, how are we going to try and fix the situation there? Um, so one of the things we've done as of Android O, I think, um, is VTS will enforce, VTS is Android's vendor test suite. VTS will enforce that you are shipping at least one of these kernels from uh, below. Um, on newly launching devices. So in Android 11, your device, if you're shipping a new product, you'll have to ship 4.14, 4.19, or 5.4. Um, the reason why we have these extra kernels is because uh, SOC manufacturers, you know, they, 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 are, they don't all agree on exactly what kernel they're going to use for a particular product lifecycle for a particular year. So we have to give them some flexibility. Um, but uh, we are looking at um, kind of at uh, least locking it down to three and maybe, maybe fewer in the future. Um, another problem that Android has is that because through Project Treble, which was an initiative that ran for the last, for the, ran for the last three or four years, um, Android is, we're trying to encourage people to upgrade, make it easier for vendors to upgrade uh, devices to newer versions of Android. And so that means we have to then fold in older kernels as well. So for Android 11, that means that we will have to support for upgrades 4.4 and 4.9 kernels. Um, so as you can see, from a graphics point of view, display point of view, that's a lot of kernels to test. It's a lot, there's been a lot of changes between 4.4 and 5.4, and there'll be more changes in mainline by the time Android 11 comes out. Um, so it is a real challenge to try and um, improve this uh, testing matrix to make it more possible to validate these drivers uh, upstream. Um, another problem is vendor kernels don't necessarily, even if they're 4.4, 4.9, 4.14 kernels, they may have cherry-picked forward or back uh, patches 
or entire subsystems even, from other kernel versions. So uh, two vendors here, uh, which are real, real examples, um, where DRM was taken from a newer version of, the, of Linux kernel and backported to 414, and, and uh, ION was actually taken from an older Linux kernel and forward ported to 414. So when we're testing kind of critical kernel subsystems uh, relating to graphics and multimedia for Android, um, it's very difficult to write an all-encompassing test because you're having to test all these different versions of the interface. Some of them are very different. Um, and you can't really detect them based on the kernel version or anything like that. You just, you kind of just have to know, well, that when I'm running on this device, it has this particular set of functionality um, and then uh, test whatever you, what you know about that device. And so we kind of want to clean this up um, so that it make it easier for us to say, when somebody ships a 419 kernel, or a 5.4 kernel, we know what they're running and, and how they're running. So along comes ge uh, generic kernel image, which is something uh, um, our team's been kind of uh, discussing publicly since, I think, Plumbers last year. Um, the idea is we would, Android would, would kind of come up with a dist kind of distro style kernel, which means that we would provide a kernel binary, um, which we're calling GKI for Android devices. This, um, image would be used for testing for validation. And basically what that means is that if you build a Android product, you would install the GKI kernel before you ran VTS CTS and the compliance results that you would get from that device would be run on top of this kernel rather than the kernel that you were planning to ship your product with. I'll go into more details on what that actually looks like. Um, and if anybody's interested in this, um, there's an article on LWN about uh, GKI um, and, and what it's, the aims are for fragment to reduce fragmentation. Um, so the branches that this GKR project is going to be supported on are 4.19 and 5.4, and any kernel coming out of Android moving forwards. Um, what GKR really is is just the def config. Um, it's nothing more than that. Um, and the kernel tree is itself, of course. Um, the idea is it will work on all ARM64 devices. We'll also have a validation target for x86-64 because of our cloud platform. And uh, it will always be built with Clang and always be hermetically built, so it's reproducible. So these images will be available in AOSP. Uh, anybody can download them. Uh, they will just be basically the Android common kernel, which is basically derived from upstream, but um, uh, compiled in a specific configuration. So one of the things that comes along with that that's important is we need to be able to ensure that when we are uh, updating these kernels that the manufacturers don't need to update their device drivers at the same time, because if you're an Android product um, and you want to uh, and you you want to try a newer GKI to see if a security fix has been a security problem has been fixed or if a new feature is available, whatever it ends up being through LTS, then you can install that GKI image without having to uh, recompile your uh, the vendor's device drivers for that device. Some of which you may not even have source code for. Most in most cases, of course, you would, but it still doesn't necessarily make it that easy. Um, so one of the things that the kernel team will be doing next year, as of next year is uh, ensuring exactly like kind of how Red Hat Enterprise Linux and how SUSE work, where they uh, maintain a certain amount of uh, binary compatibility between modules and the kernel for about for a certain amount of time um, on, on on the kernel branches that GKI is supported on. Um, so this is just kind of example of what it will look like in our in our CI system. Um, so, what does that actually boil down to in terms of compliance? Um, so. For those of you who are familiar with Android, this will probably be quite straightforward. There's a few new things in here that maybe we haven't seen before, but I'll explain them. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with Android, kind of everything is, um, all Android devices will have at least a boot system and vendor image. The vendor image is provided by the OEM. The system image is usually provided by the OEM too, but we can also provide, Google can provide an OEM uh, system image called GSI, which is our generic system image. Um, and the kernel is usually provided by the OEM. Um, and that's what one of the things that GKI will change is it will actually uh, allow us to replace part of the boot image, which the bootloader will use to start the device, with a Google-provided image rather than with a partner-provided image. Um, so as you can see from the diagram, um, the kernel modules are all the drivers that the device uses are now built as, as uh, kernel modules. Um, any drivers that are considered non-boot device drivers will be in the vendor image. Anything that's required to boot up, like flash drivers or clock drivers or uh, regulator drivers, those things will be in, our RAM, in a RAM disk. And those RAM disks will actually be combined by the bootloader to uh, combine Google's GKI image and whatever the vendor's providing during the boot sequence. 
And the power of this is that we can actually check that um, the uh, in, because we we are running we are the first piece of code running on the device uh, when the boot image starts. We can actually check that the device is compliant um, and that the uh, the the drivers have been loaded from the correct place against the correct kernel image. And that's what we do in our boot image. Um, but the idea is. The, the, the devices can still ship with the kernel, which is more in the old style of the boot image, um, but they, they, they can also then be sideloaded, and a GKI or GSI image can be installed onto those devices to allow us to, to verify that they are actually compliant devices. Um, so what does this mean for displaying graphics? Um, it means that uh, all drivers are modules, um, which means that although vendors can still patch these drivers, they can only use the symbolic interface exported by GKI. So that means that the, in the case of DRM, the DRM core will be compiled into GKI, even though the drivers are compiled out of the GKI. That means that by the time the GKI is completed for a particular Android release, any changes or patches that those vendors need have to, has to be incorporated into the Android kernel. Um, another thing we're thinking about doing is building DMA buff into the, into the GKI image. and. Kind of the reason for this is security and bug fixes that we can get via LTS if we build it into the GKR, which wouldn't otherwise be there if it was built out. In the case of DMA buff, it has to be built into the kernel anyway because it doesn't support module uh, being built as a module. Um, and this whole process will be verified by Android VTS. So the, use, the, vent, the, the person validating their device will actually flash GKI, flash GSI, and, and run this uh, validation stack. Um, and more on the comment about backporting subsystems. Um, so one of the things we've been doing as well is we, with all of us work with GKI and with uh, the Android kernel, we need to uh, improve validation of display drivers. Um, so one of the things we've been doing is we've added uh, IGT GPU, to, GPU tools to AOSP, which enables the, the DRM subsystem to be tested from Android user space. Um, there's a, there's a, a topic that if anybody's interested, they can take a look at where I'm starting to port the IGT project to AOSP. Um, and... Uh, we, we, after that, we'll establish a baseline test that we can run on our EOSP platforms in Pixel. Um, but uh, in spite of this, it can still be tough to, to, to verify that uh, upstream is working because the devices that we'll be running these tests on will still be running older kernels, they'll have older software stacks. So we have our virtual platform and our EOSP platforms that will continue to run upstream Linux uh, to kind of keep us honest. Um, so here's an example make file. Uh, this is IGT ported to Android. We have to port it to Android's Blueprint build system because we don't have access to Mason in Android. Um, we, uh, it's a requirement for it to be built natively for Android because it's, uh, it's required for VTS, and VTS is actually a native program that runs on the Android device. It can't run in a kind of other alternative Linux environment. Um, there were some changes required to AOSP to make IGT build against uh, AOSP, like exporting libraries, making it possible for the guests to use those libraries. Um, some libraries just aren't applicable to Android, like Cairo or Glib, where Android just doesn't have these libraries, so they were mocked out. Um, and there's still some uh, to-dos for UDEV and Proc PROCPS, which are libraries that Android also doesn't have. Um, but it's coming along. Um, and kind of in the future, one of the things we'll be thinking about is kind of AOSP, testing AOSP devices with Chameleon, devices that have HDMI connections. Um, so lastly, kind of the, the question point for me is, um, trying to tackle this problem of all these different versions of DRM and all these different open source stack implementations upstream. Obviously, most of the people here will want to be focused on the upstream versions of these. They won't care about the version that shipped in 4.14 or some old version of Mesa or some old DRM Harbor Composer. So ideally, we're all working on the upstream versions of these files. Um, so one of our ideas is one of the things we can leverage with GKI is we, can actually, we could actually backport DRM um, from 5.4, which will be our next LTS kernel for Android 11, to the older kernels that we support for launch devices. And kind of what that means is that if you're building a graphics stack for Android and you intend to ship it in Android 11, it would be using the same common code for DRM. Um, and the same thing for DMA buff, because we want to get rid of ION, and ION's going to be replaced with DMA buff heaps soon. Um, and that's not going to make 5.4, so we, we, we're thinking about backporting DMA buff from 5.5 to 5.4, 419. Um, V4L2 request API is another example of this for Codec 2. Um, and then finally, just wrapping up, uh, the um, future things that we're looking at doing, which, which are also feeding into this process, 
Uh, we want reusable sync support. Uh, Vulkan requires reusable syncs. We want them for other reasons in Android to reduce binder overhead uh, when, for applications that are rendering and synchronizing between each other. Um, I was told that DRM already has this for the DRM sync obj, but it's something that might need to be made slightly more generic so it can work between drivers. Um, and then obviously after we've tackled the display graphics side of this problem, we'll be looking at codecs and the camera stack, um, which also are quite inconsistent on Android devices. And kind of the whole, the whole motivation is just to make the testing more uniform and to be able to fold test for graphics and other multimedia uh, stacks into Android conformance testing. So, so hopefully, uh, you know, the, the, the multimedia landscape starts to look better, more testable, more consistent. Features are more commonly available on Android devices. Um, and that's it. If anybody's got any questions. Uh, so hey, I'm IGT maintainer. So uh, question is, to, uh, do you plan to upstream that support for Android? Because in the past we had support for Android that was uh, before the blueprint became a thing. Yes. So it was the makefile based one. Yes. Uh, no one was using that uh, after we stopped using that ourselves. Yeah. Uh, so I issued a question whether anyone wants to maintain that. No answers in a few months, so we just uh, butchered it out. So, but if you want that in IGT, we would be happy to do that, and we cannot compile it on the device, but we can add like a GitLab pipeline element that tries to compile and make sure that it all works for you. Yes, uh, so we, we will definitely uh, upstream any changes we make to IGT. Build system files wise, I'm not sure how much you know about Blueprint, but it's not backwards compatible between Android versions. I know, I know. And for other, Android, for other open source projects, that's going to be a, kind of been a source of problems because people want to support multiple Android versions in their open source project, which BP doesn't really support architecturally. So we might keep the BP files outside of the IGT project, uh, but it would be entirely at your discretion. We're happy to contribute them if it's useful for the, for, for the project. Uh, yeah, so if it breaks less stuff for you and you want to actively maintain that, yep. uh, <coughs> then we are happy to like, make sure that it at least compiles and yep. uh, have them in the project. Yep. Yep. So Absolutely. just contact us and we're happy to help. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so... Um, Mesa is really struggling with having the Android.make files in the Mesa tree because they're a constant source of regressions. Mesa developers have no way to test them. We would love to get to one build system for Mesa. Is there any hope for being able to connect build plan to a Mason invocation to generate our ninja files um, so that we could have a single build system for the project? So I think the... the um the answer from the Android build team has historically been no, because um, Android's had many build systems that it's had to connect to its own build system in the past, and they're finally going through the whole tree, removing everything that's not compiling with the, with the, the, the Blueprint system. Um, and, and so I think it, the most likely path to make that successful would be something which generates BP files, like an upstream project, like, like maybe like an intermediate build system like, like Mason or CMake that would generate uh, BP files. I mean, the issue there is that Mason generates a ninja file, which is you know, ultimately what build plan yeah. also generates. Yes, yes. Um, but that ninja file is then customized to the specific options that you'd supply. You yes. Know, so it's it already encoded things like what architecture you're building for and what yes. driver you're building and all of that. So yes. I think one of the things that was pro proposed upstream by John Stoltz was just to delete the make files. Um, uh, which, he's been very resistant to that. I desperately want to delete those make files. I mean, you've got my <laughs> blessing to delete them, <laughs> if that helps. <laughs> uh, because I think it's not, as I was explaining with the BP problem in general, it's just very hard for us. We're, we're happy to maintain these files in AOSP. We don't need them to be maintained in these individual projects. Yeah. And actually, many of the back ends in Mesa aren't really applicable to our efforts anyway. I mean, we're not going to build. Uh, I mean, there are some dri driver targets we're just not going to build. Um, so having make files for those doesn't really make sense. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a bunch of tests that uh, use Cairo and IGT that are kind of useful for display testing. How difficult would it be to enable that rather than just stop that out? Uh, I'd like to port them. Um, kind of open to suggestions about how to do that. Um, I'm using, I'm guessing Cairo is being used to draw things. So I guess you would need to use yeah. an analogous library like Skier or some other library in Android. I don't know if that's been something that's been thought of, but I don't think bringing Cairo into Android will be feasible. 
Yes, but I don't think we'd take it into AOSP because it's not used by other target code. It would only be used by the test. So there would be extenuating circumstances to add that library. Uh, we prefer to port to something we already have in the framework rather than bring Cairo in. Because Cairo has a whole bunch of other dependencies like glib and other dependency libraries that we don't use on Android. Okay, thanks. Yep. So, we got um, so in one of the, in one of your slides, you have um, um, the GKI um, driver subsystem. Yeah, this one. This one? Uh, yeah, subsystem um, drivers and uh, vendor uh, drivers and vendor boot image. What criteria do you guys use to determine which driver has to go in subsystem and which driver are going in the vendor image? Uh, we, so we have had for the last couple of years kind of an open request out to anybody who wants to, if the vendors are uh, planning on releasing Android 11 products uh, that re will require the GK validation, um, they should make suggestions to us to add things to the def config. So the GK def config is maintained in AOSP, you just go in and change it, upload a CL, and we'll probably just add the feature that you want to add to the GKI. Removing things from the GKI is different. That would be a more complicated process. So for example, if you wanted to build your own copy of V4L2, you would have to remove it from GKI, um, and that's something that you know, would be more contentious. The idea of GKI is that we can show that we can deliver uh, uh, LTS. So we, we want as much kernel code as possible that we'd actually ship on an Android device to be in the GKI image and only drivers to be outside of it. Okay. 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 You just mentioned uh, you will replace DMA buff uh, in your slide. Uh, I want to... Uh, uh, sorry, we won't replace DMA buff. DMA buff will actually be replacing iOS. Yeah, yeah, you know. And DMA buff is... is has two com components. Uh, one is the reservation. One another is fence. Yes. Uh, is wide use for uh, DRM kernel driver. So yes. Mano, how can you handle these two case if you replace the DM DM buff driver? Yes, that we have discussed that. Um, I think the at the moment the need to pull DMA buff back or forwards in kernel versions is probably quite tied to DRM. Yeah. So. As you mentioned, it's used on a lot of DRM drivers, but there would be other drivers outside of DRM that would be affected by that change that we would have to update. Um, so we haven't really looked at the feasibility yet of actually backporting and forward porting DMA buff. I'd like to be able to do that uh, because I think aligning to upstream DMA buff is important, um, but it would probably be done in, with, with DRM. So that means that the only DMA buff that would be in Android 11 would be the one that was in 5.4, oh. or 5.5 actually in this case. Does okay. that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. In general, we don't want to actually do many backports because if we backport things, then we have to be like a mini, a mini Greg KH and do backports of security fixes to those backports of changes. So ideally, yeah. we don't want to do that. Yes, I understand. It, yeah. Actually, in our drivers, at uh, least two components is widely used in our drivers. So, um, if so, I I'm I don't know why uh, I don't know if this component is in removed. So. How can we handle in this kind of case? Oh, we wouldn't remove it. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, since Android has to get code from other projects like the Linux kernel and so on, and that the build system are different, is is there a plan like to abstract the build system like Yocto or something like that to integrate better with them? Um, so. I think having something, having a makefile generator which generates makefiles for your project that work with your build system, like the example that was given to make ninja files, for example, is a better path forward than asking for those build systems to be brought into AOSP. Oh. Just because it's, to, it's to just a, an internal issue with, our, with the scalability of our architecture. We want to have a unified build system because we can shard it more and it, it works better with the Google infrastructure. Right. So we don't want to support wrapping of build systems in AOSP. We actually just rewrote the build system for basically everything that gets built on target to use the same, tech, the same build system um, for Android devices. So I'm, I know it's not an ideal answer, uh, but it, ha yeah. it is how the situation is now. Okay, and if people are working on like making something like that, would it be useful somehow? Or? Well, it sounds like it would be very useful to others if there was ability to generate BP files or MK no, files. No, uh, abstracting the build system, like making Yocto, uh, like uh, recipes and things like that for for building Android apps. Yeah, no, uh, no, for building Android the the full source tree with the Linux kernel and things like that. Oh, I see. You want to build the kernel in the Android tree at the same time? Yes. Uh, okay, yes. People have asked us about that. We generally don't do that in Android, but there are various solutions to that problem if you are interested in doing it. Android kernel, MK comes to mind, which I think was yeah, either an Intel or Qualcomm thing. Yeah, but this is the point. Like, you have to know if there is something that has been uh, changed, 
and so you run yes. uh, make inside the Linux kernel. So that was the point of my question: is is there a way to abstract that to have still the good performance and not need to go in each project that has a, like reconfig build system and check if something was changed and whatnot? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe we could talk more afterwards. Does okay. I understand? Okay, thanks. I'm at time, right? Okay, thank you. Just uh, I'll be out uh, in the corridor afterwards. Got any more questions? <coughs>